the postpone. Okay. So then we proceed to our next speaker, Professor Harvey Friedman. He is a presently distinguished university professor of mathematics, computer science, and philosophy at Ohio State University. His field is mathematical logic, his research field, and he graduated uh, already when he was 18 years old and was appointed the youngest professor ever at Stanford University at the age of 18, entering the Guinness Book of Records. Uh, and, uh, that, but of course, that was not his, his most, <coughs> maybe most re remarkable, but no, most important achievement. Uh, after various stations at the University of Wisconsin, State University of New York at Buffalo, he is anchored since 77 at Ohio State University. And I should also mention that in between, for 10 years, he was professor of music. And he is an excellent piano player. And his uh, special research fields are inverse or reverse mathematics, namely from a given theory or theory to conclude what are the necessary axioms th uh, that you need in order to actually prove such a theory. And today he gives us a talk on necessary uses of extremely high infinities for the finite. Well, thank you for that wonderful introduction, which is approximates some truth. And um, I will, um, uh, I want to thank the organizers and the John Templeton Foundation for this experience. Uh, I gain a lot from, um, uh, from these meetings, uh, new contacts, new ideas, and so forth. Um, so let's see, I guess this does work pretty well. Wonders of technology. Um, so uh, we have here the, um, I think the good form acknowledgement, right? Nice, nice, nice big letters. Uh, remember, 36297, okay. <laughs> All right. Um, now there's a, a considerable literature concerning theoretical aspects and implications of infinity. Um, we are optimistic about a future major integration of this literature with a purely scientific literature on infinity, although I think that um, we're some distance away from this, some good new ideas are needed, and I have to confess to you that I haven't uh, spent an appropriate amount of effort trying to do this, but I have put it as a higher priority for me because of this meeting. Um, the JTF volume, Infinity, New Research Frontiers, Cambridge University Press came out in 2011, has five papers focused on this topic. Uh, infinity is a transformative concept in science and, and, and theology. God in Infinity, notes on the concept of the infinite in the history of Western metaphysics. God in Infinity, theological insights from Canner's mathematics, and the partially skeptical response to Hart and Russell. Uh, and uh, this is just one place. These, of course, you know, you can get more references. This is more references from the references and then more references from the references from the references and so forth, uh, spoken as a logician, uh, going back uh, uh, hereditarily, okay? All right, so uh, <coughs> what I wanna talk about is research I've been doing for 45 years um, in one way or another uh, con concerning the unexpected, I'll use a different word, unexpected influence of the extreme finite on the finite. Now, first of all, I noticed after I did these uh, uh, slides uh, that I don't have too much of a tutorial on, on uh, what the little infinite is and what the big infinite is. A lot of people who are not mathematicians think that there's only one infinity, one, one at least mathematical form of infinity. But the smallest infinity is the infinity of the whole numbers, one, two, the counting numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That sounds like a lot of numbers, but this is the smallest infinity in the usual way we look at these, this. The next, uh, the, the next one of, from, from a, from a, um, uh, uh, non-technical point of view, I, you know, there's a footnote. Uh, whenever I, uh, one gives a talk like this, there's a certain amount of benign lying that goes on, okay? So let me, let me, 
if you come up to me and say, but you forgot to talk about Aleph One, I will, I will refer to the benign line. So the next step up really is the real line. There are, in the standard way of talking about infinities, there is uh, more um, real numbers than there are natural numbers. And this is an, uh, sort of the next natural level. And so forth, there are many other higher levels. And of course, there's the ultimate level, which is the totality, such as it is, of everything whatsoever, which is the most extreme form. Um, and there are things in between. All right, now, um, there are uses of infinity, uh, uh, uses of extreme infinity to get information about the finite or the small inf infinite that are necessary. And this is what, what I concentrate on. What's really necessary? Without relying on the extreme infinite, we know we cannot make these inferences. We know we cannot make these inferences. Uh, we are treating this long-term investigation as preliminary to focusing on direct, any direct in integration of scientific and theological aspects of infinity. There's an obvious rough, but, and I emphasize rough, but suggestive analogy between knowledge about the finite or small infinite that can only be gained through use of the extreme infinite and knowledge about practical life that can only be gained through use of theology. This is a, a, a motivator for, uh, for this, okay? But we're not there yet to make this, you know, really hard-nosed, but, but that's in the background. So that's the style of the thing we're talking about. In other words, abstract ideas that look totally useless, are, 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 uh, uh, you'd, li you'd like to see them used in an essential way for the most transparent and simple things. That's what we want to do. And the point I'm making is that this, has been, this is being accomplished, starting with Kurt Gödel, this is being accomplished in the mathematical realm. All right, but before I can really get into this, I want to, I want to uh, discuss some general features of the foundations of mathematics. And besides, independently of this talk, that's good for you to hear a little bit about. Foundations of Mathematics is one of these unbelievably great unexpected successes uh, in philosophical thinking uh, 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 that uh, philosophical and scientific thinking uh, that too few people understand uh, too well and, uh, and I believe that there are a lot of lessons to learn from it for foundations of other things. Um, so the, 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 uh, the, the current foundation of mathematics we have is, starts off with, a def, has a definite criteria for what a mathematical statement is. If you don't have a definite criteria of what a mathematical statement is, you can hardly do foundations of mathematics in the deep sense that we have. So there's a, there's, there's, um, and for those of you who know uh, this somewhat, I'll use a buzzword, first order predicate calculus with equality is a background logic and you formulate statements in, with, with the connectives and the quantifiers. Now pretend I didn't say that if you didn't find that familiar, okay? All right, secondly, a definitive list, a definite list of axioms and rules that support the purely logical inferences, purely logical inferences. Uh, all men are uh, mortals, uh, Socrates is a man, Socrates is mortal, that's a purely logical inference. Um, and, um, there is a definite list of actions and rules supporting purely logical inferences that has been justified as not missing anything, i.e. complete. And that's work of Kurt Gödel in his completeness theorem. His incompleteness theorem is more famous. But his completeness theorem, which was uh, done in his PhD thesis, that one um, uh, uh, justifies the accepted analysis of the axioms and rules of logic. And the third thing is the more problematic part of the foundations of mathematics. Uh, a definite list of axioms about mathematical objects, so-called non-logical axioms, uh, to be used in conjunction with two. These are axioms about mathematical objects, saying you can construct mathematical objects in certain ways legally, legally and, and so forth. Uh, uh, which go beyond pure, pure logic. They, they're not pure logic, they're, 
they, they really depend on what they really depend on what you're talking about. Pure logic does not depend on what you're talking about. Only the form. Uh, but but uh, number three, okay, uh, it does okay. So that is the general shape of the foundations of mathematics that we use. And it's called, uh, the usual foundation is called ZFC, or it's a metal Frankel set theory with the X of a choice. Um, uh, now, if I wanted to do something horrible to you, I wouldn't give you a list of all the axioms. But notice I didn't, okay? So, and it's not important to get a picture of what I'm talking. This is, this is a pictorial talk. All right, now in the late 1920s, a Pacific list for these uh, axioms of, uh, these, these non-logical axioms, was was fixed on uh, by the late 20s, which was easily sufficient to support all generally accepted existing mathematical developments. All mathematical developments could be handled easily within this framework. And the resulting formal system called ZFC, as I said, now it supports the use of extremely infinite mathematical objects. It definitely does far, far more than just simply little things like all the whole numbers. I say with a little bit of a grin, because that's still considered pretty big uh, by most people. Um, and, uh, and far bigger than the uh, real numbers and far bigger than many, many, many things. Um, so ZFC is really a big, heavy-handed, you know, big tool. Uh, now, some of these, now, there have been a, a lot of modifications of ZFC are also, also, are also worked on and used by me and others. One's weaker than ZFC to illustrate that you don't need the whole sledgehammer. And, and things that are much stronger than ZFC, which, which, um, which use yet more extreme infinities. In fact, extremely more extreme infinities and extremely more, extremely more, and even and so forth. In other words, there, there is a, an, an apparently open-ended sequence of extremeness, okay? Is this any good for anything? That's the issue. Okay. Well, let's, to, to lay the background for this, I, have to, I should now talk about Gödel's two incompleteness theorems. It's important to remember that Gödel has two incompleteness theorems, and they both, um, uh, are very important to, to be mentioning. The first incompleteness theorem is that if you have this system, ZFC, or any system like it, uh, then there's always going to be statements that are in the purview of that system which can neither be proved nor refuted. That can neither be proved nor refuted. That's his first incompleteness theorem. More technically, if you have a system T which is free of contradiction, subject to some mild conditions, there are statements that cannot be proved or refuted in T. Now, that means you can't fix this. You can't fix this by adding some special um, axioms to ZFC and round it out because, that, because the girdle first incomplete theorem will still apply after you've added these new ones. Okay, so... This is the very nature of the foundations of mathematics, open-ended beast in this sense, okay? All right, now the second incompleteness theorem also is of, of absolutely central importance for what I'm going to, where I'm going with this. Um, and this, this theorem addresses in a very deep way, it addresses but does not resolve, I'll put it that way, it addresses but not, does not resolve two questions. One, in ZF, is ZFC and systems like ZFC free of contradiction? In other words, have we just made an error and fooled ourselves? Have we gone off the deep end and got electrocuted without knowing it by extreme infinities? Have we, right? That's, the number, that's question number one. Question number two, what kind of examples are there of statements that cannot be proved or refuted in ZFC and systems like ZFC? What kind of examples do we have? It's the second uh, question. So Gödel's second incompleteness theorem tells us this. For any formal system T free of contradiction, the statement T is free of contradiction itself cannot be proved in the system. For any, uh, for any decent T, the statement that T is, not, is free of contradiction itself cannot be established in T. All right. 
Now, um, that's an, now, so the statement ZFC is free of contradiction is not provable in ZFC, and it's almost certainly not refutable in ZFC, because we kind of believe that ZFC is a good thing. And part of being good is it's free of contradiction, and part of being good is also that you can't prove it's not free of contradiction. So, 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 so uh, 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 Gödel gave an example of a statement that's not provable or refutable in ZFC, namely ZFC is free of contradiction. He gave an example of a statement. Now, for a while, that was the only examples around that you know of any of any uh, import. All right, but let me, let me focus on this. We've seen through Gödel that ZFC alone is not sufficient to prove that ZFC is contradiction. Now, however, we can prove that ZFC is free of contradiction if we bring in a yet more extreme infinity. This is where I'm going. If we bring in a more extreme infinity, we can prove that ZFC is consistent. This is an example of how you use extremeness to your advantage. Okay, the background is George Cantor, founder of set theory, pushed infinity to an unprecedented extreme level uh, by what he calls inaccessible cardinals. An inaccessible cardinal can be used to prove that ZFC is free of contradiction, and ZFC alone is not enough, as we've seen before. So we say that using an inaccessible cardinal, we have a transcendental proof that ZFC is free of contradiction. Can't remove the really extreme thing that it uses, which is this inaccessible cardinals. Okay? So this, so this origin of using extreme infinities to prove things about the finite uh, world uh, or small world, relatively small world, uh, uh, is, starts with Gödel. All right, now what is the extent of these transcendental proofs? Well, there are really only three example, three kinds of examples in existence. One is transcendental proofs that certain formal systems are free of contradiction. I, we were, that's what we've been talking about, that, 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 that uh, kind of example. The second kind of example is in the area of descriptive set theory involving rather general sets of real numbers. So this, is, this was an area uh, in the first half of the 20th century which was um, intensively studied. And this, um, um, uh, this area involves sets of real numbers of rather ab abstract kind, substantially worse than what's called Borel measurable. Now, I don't, I don't want to get into too many details, because I think only the mathematicians here will understand this. But nevertheless, there is this, this area. And then there's other. Transcendental proofs of a series of statements in finite and countable mathematics involving finite and infinite sets of integers and rational numbers. Uh, now, only those in, in category three are truly compatible in spirit with current math mathematical culture with its emphasis on down-to-earth topics. So without three, we are in a situation where people can say, I don't really care about uh, extreme infinities because it doesn't bother, it has nothing to do with the things that I'm worried about. Uh, because I don't, I'm not interested in formal systems. I'm not a logician, I do, I do real math. And, uh, or I could say, well, you know, I don't care about, the only kind of sets of reals I care about are probably open or closed or, or F sigmas, G deltas, I don't know if you know what that is. We all, I only care about these rather specific kinds of sets of real numbers and this rest of this stuff doesn't, you know, I don't care about it, it's too abstract. And so therefore, I'm immune to this. Uh, it's sort of like saying, you know, I come in here and I bake bread and I go home for a living and I put my kids to bed and so forth. I don't really care about this theology. It doesn't affect them. You know, it's a very similar kind of thing. Okay. So, uh, so let me talk about these new ones, number three with an eye on the clock, and I know that we started late and so forth, so I have to go maybe a few minutes. Uh, two minutes, uh, yeah, I think we started quite late, though. All right. Uh, okay. Oh, I have? I just started. Uh, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, all right. 
the, these examples involve graphs. A graph is a set of vertices with some of the pairs connected by an edge. I don't mean a graph in the sense of parabolas. It's about graphs, and it's about cliques and graphs. A clique is a, is a group of people who know each other. Okay, so it's a group of vertices, it's a bunch of vertices that, that are con each of which are connected. A maximal clique is a clique where you can't make it bigger. It's, a, it's, not, it's not part of a bigger clique. And the study of maximal cliques is a, a, a considerable, uh, you, can get, you can find a large Google, Google hit. Now, embedding properties in mathematics are, are also very common. You know, what kind of embeddings uh, 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 high dimensional sets have and so uh, 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 this stuff involves the embedded maximal clique theorem asserts we can find a maximal clique in any, any of these concrete graphs which has a certain embedding property. Okay. And uh, I have a, a, a version of this which I can't talk about too much. Okay. Uh, the, the statement says that every graph of a certain kind has a maximal clique with a certain embedding property, and that can be restated by saying that a certain algorithm, given, a, given one of these definite graphs, uh, one of these explicit graphs, there's an algorithm for, for building, non-deterministic algorithm, for building the maximal clique with the desired property. You can prove that if you can build the clique, if you can go on with this process for any finite number of steps, then you can go on this process infinitely. So we now have what's called a finite process embedded maximal clique theorem. But then we can go further. We can ask whether or not we can go on for say, um, what was the number I used, 16 steps. So we now arrive at, at the following statement, which says that if I have one of these good graphs that, you know, that, I, that I can be given explicitly, I didn't have time to talk about the explicit presentation of these things. If I have a nice graph, I, and I have this algorithm for building an ultimate maximal clique that with the embedding property, then let's just see if I can prove that we can go on for 16 steps. Not for infinitely many steps, but for 16 steps. And there's some heuristics involved in seeming to, uh, seeming to indicate, I, I want to hedge my bets a little here, seeming to indicate that the only way we could possibly prove this fact is either to run the machine and spit out a 16 length sequence by search, by a search algorithm, run the machine, which is experimentation, right? Run the machine, or prove the, the embedding theorem, which says there's an infinite, you can go on infinitely much and just take the first, chop it off at the first 16. This seems to be the only way you can either run the experiment, in, it's an actual physical experiment, Take a real computer, load this algorithm in, run the experiment. We know that the experiment must finish because uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, it can be done by uh, exhaustive search and the, and the memory and time is not too bad. We, so we either run it or we think with an extreme infinity. So, th so if this is right, then what, I, what, I, what, what this seems to indicate is that there's a way to interact between the most extreme conceptions of the human mind of a scientific kind. Uh, there's a way to interact substantially with a piece of reality on your desktop. Thank you. So we have time for discussion. This is a, a, a really just a question, but I have several colleagues. Uh, you started with the medieval example. I have several colleagues at Cambridge that are working on medieval modal logic. And uh, as I understand, they're not historians of ideas, they're logicians. So, and there, there's still quite a lot of interest in medieval modal logic. Isn't Helsinki's a big center for it? So isn't there quite a, it's not just a sort of artifact of the past, and it isn't something that uh, contemporary logicians are still interested no, in? No, uh, at all. Modal logic is, mod I, I think it's still bloody. Modal logic is, is one of the, of the big, big uh, flourishing parts of, of non-classic logics, more than many others, more, for example, than intuitionism. So, so a lot of uh, 
Yeah, hundreds of hundreds of, of papers, especially in propositional of other logic. In philosophy programs, also. Right? Yeah, 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 also, 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 yeah. Uh, okay. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> I guess my, my question is, is I think the, uh, there's a comment and a question. So the comment is, I think one of, one of the risks of talks like, like these at a session like this is that there are, there are words and phrases that have very careful definitions in the, in the domain of mathematics and philosophical logic that don't transport over easily into, into other domains. So when people hear words like intuitionism or um, there are no strict definitions or discourse has to be object free, uh, I think it's very easy for people to assume, well, it just shows that, you know, we don't need to take lo logic or reasoning very seriously in these domains, and if we run into paradoxes, we just throw up our hands and say, well, the mathematicians told us that that's okay. We don't have to make sense of those things. And I, and I don't think that's what you mean to imply by the talk. So now let me turn this around into the question. So as a philosopher, I would teach first-order predicate calculus with quantification to students, and we do truth trees and truth tables and, and derivations and so on. <coughs> and I think all those are actually very helpful in typical philosophical reasoning. There's worries about vagueness when it comes to uh, objects. There's worries about how we do strict definitions. But if we can set those things aside, uh, is it the case that we're doing something wrong by teaching first order predicate calculus with quantification to our students? Are we not helping, helping them? Are we taking them further away from the way they ought to think about the process of reasoning? Um, and however you answer that question, what do you think the implications are for thinking about science and theology and the connection between those things? It sounds like a big question, but I, I don't think it's as big as it sounds. <laughs> I, uh, I, 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 uh, so first of all, uh, I think there's nothing negative in teaching classical logic which underlies mathematics. Yeah? Uh, the, point is, uh, the point is only one should, one should be aware that logic underlies assumptions as every, everything else. And you have, of course, if you <laughs> say this logic justifies this field, for example, for some reason. Uh, you have to think about whether you can live with this exam uh, these assumptions. So for example, as long as mathematics is concerned, our world of engineering and such, classical logic is completely all right. Uh, the, uh, the talk was only about that, that in some situations you might, for this or that uh, reason, uh, not agree with some assumptions of the classic logic. We already had yesterday an exa ex example in quantum logics, which is also not compatible with classic logics. So there might such situations arise. And I, I do not say, forget about classic logic, only I say uh, one should be aware that the use of classic logic is not a self-evident thing, as the use of mathematics is also not. Yeah, please, please. Oh, okay. Uh, there are some, I mean, look, everything has limitations. For instance, if you want to decide whether to buy a house or, or move to a new job, you probably don't want to first consult first order predicate calculus. Okay, so, uh, um, but there are some areas where, I mean, where augmenting it is, it looks like it's, com it's completely here to stay and fundamental. Program verification is in its infancy. How do you, you know, how do you, how do you, how do you design programs? How do you design programs and test them that, so that, the, so that you have an objective measure that they're completely correct? And what does that mean? And all that stuff. And you get into how to specify what a program is supposed to do and all that stuff. The, the basic fundamental tool under all, under all that is first order predicate calculus, but it has to be embellished with some other things. So it depends on what your students are going to go do. They might go do eight, uh, 85 different things you can't predict. Uh, predicate calculus is a good uh, central uh, tool. And it's here to stay in, in, in some contexts here to stay. In particular, a lot of, a lot of computer contexts, it's here to stay. So Bob Russell from CTNS, uh, thank you both for your, your lectures. And thank you very much for mentioning the book from the Foundation, it's a fine book. 
Um, so a question for either of you. Um, I've got a student who has a PhD in mathematics. He's doing a second degree in theology. And his, um, he's exploring the use of fuzzy logic in theology. So he says, instead of just having first order predicate or even having sort of quantum logic where you say A and not A are both true, so it's wave and particle. He's, he's saying theological concepts almost require what is, is called technically fuzzy logic. And I'm wondering if either of you think that makes any sense to you or what you'd recommend I, I do in relating to my student about this. Thank you. I wish I was more expert in this, but I think uh, fuzzy logic is among other things that should be considered. Uh, I have a feeling though that for a lot of these purposes, we don't have the right logics at all. So this idea of using something off the shelf. Uh, when I go to, them to the clothing store, I don't ever seem to get anything. My, some of my friends can, but I can't get anything off the shelf. So, I, I would say that uh, uh, it depends very much on his, his application. To search for another uh, logic is reasonable. But for example, to give the example of uh, fuzzy logic. Fuzzy logic is a typical logic you use when you want to describe uh, the great number. Now, the great number is obviously not a classical concept, otherwise it has the smallest great number. And, and, but uh, in fuzzy logic has something to do with measurement. So if you want to answer this question, you should look whether in his problems a certain measurement plays a role. If not, there might be also other logics feasible, modal logics and so on. Willem de Gees, Leiden University. Uh, I have a question uh, to both of you, in a sense, to comment on each other's paper, because I'm very confused. It's like two theologians sitting there, one being highly agnostic, saying intuition is we can just get this far, but not much farther, and the other, well, highly metaphysical, bridging to this extreme infinity. Uh, you seem to be sitting friendly next to each other, but do you agree about each other's approach, or is it really very different? I think we both gave perfect talks for two different audiences. <laughs> no, they, they Which have a considerable over, we have some overlap with this one. <laughs> yeah, this is true. I mean, uh, anyhow, one should say. So, Harvey Friedman's talk was about mathematical logic. Yeah, so about mathematics, based on classical logic. My talk was based on an alternative logic. In the alternative logic, you have also an alternative world. So, for example, uh, uh, for the intuitionist, maybe even, I mean, I'm not concerned with that, but for Brauer, not even Omega existed, I would guess. I guess. Uh, you, you can formulate analysis uh, with not avoiding the uncountable, if you want. But this is exactly what I said. The assumptions will drive even a different type of mathematics. So, so in my case, this was the fact that you always deal with objects who are not sharp, yeah? Sharply, they, they, they change in time. They're not unsharp as in fuzzy logic, but they change somehow in time. These are the objects of intuitionism. Change in time means simply they change with recognizing more facts as such. And in classic logic, you have sharp definition. And normally in classic, in, in, in mathematics, we want that. Uh, you do not want to hear uh, that uh, the statics is about something, or if, if uh, further information is given, we know that this house is static or something. Yeah? So in that sense, they are, they are different. Yeah? Okay. You had a question? Maybe? Yeah, well, I've got, well, I'm sure it's a... I'm sure this is a very stupid question because I don't really understand this, but is there some accommodation in this logic for something which has two answers which could both be simultaneously right but are different from each other? So if I'm working on a molecular system and it could, the molecule at one moment could be this shape and another moment could be that shape, is there so, uh, can I use that as an analogy to ask you how you can accommodate that in your logic? Well, um, <laughs> in, the, in, the realm of, in the realm of my talk, um, that would just be handled in some brutal way. Like um, one is called experiment A and the other is called experiment B and they have different answers or so, something which would not be considered a logic -y answer. In other words, it wouldn't really, it wouldn't really be a matter, I would deny that as any, wearing the hat of this talk, 
you, I would just deny this has, that your question has anything to do with logic. It's got something to do with chemistry. And your answer? Uh, in some logics, this, this is possible. So for example, the quantum logics mentioned yesterday uh, has a property that it can be that something is at the same moment here and there. Yeah? So that would be two, two answers at the same moment. So, it, so it always depends. And, and there's also an important principle in what uh, Harvey Friedman said. Namely, uh, it is always so that it is also a question what is part of the logic and what is part of, of the theory. So you can, of course, uh, balance the things against each right. other. There is always the, prop, the issue of what the proper balance is. I mean, you know, people are very conservative. They don't like to fool with their logic much. I, most people. Now, it may be different in Austria, but <laughs> <laughs> in the USA, I can guarantee you, they don't like, they like their logic fixed in grade school. <laughs> modern biology how do you you know simple logic in my experience doesn't work it's always fuzzy and it's even more complex than fuzzy so I'd love to talk to you so I could understand more about how I could think it would about be great if uh, if talking to uh, real scientists uh, I view myself as something different than that a real scientist uh, uh, would suggest a, a, a new uh, in vistas in, uh, in new vistas in uh, mathematical logic, that would be kind of an exciting thing, you see. And it is true that in quantum logics, for example, this came from the observation of John von Neumann. I mean, he was not really f in physics, but still he had a right. lot of knowledge about it. Any other questions? Uh, Andrew Briggs from Oxford. Uh, a key advance in experimental scientific method was how do you treat discrepancies between the model and the experimental data? Is the agreement close enough that at least within the scope of that experiment it tends to confirm your theory? Or is the disagreement sufficiently big that it tends to disprove the theory? Now, with the sort of new developments in logic that you're talking about, has any comparable discipline grows up to enable you to evaluate whether there's, if there's a discrepancy between the logic and the conclusion that it, you, you have to reject the conclusion or that actually the agreement is close enough that you can accept it? May I? I would say in, in any uh, logic, you have, of course, the possibility for whatever semantic means uh, to determine that the sentence is not true because a model is not is not fulfilling as a sentence, and uh, so this is also in the in the logics I mentioned, but dif different, uh, but different. Uh, the the point is more that that as I said, this logic I mentioned works more on on non or under specified uh, objects, so. Uh, for example, in classic logic, you could come with experimental things in a fallacy, namely the fallacy that you are forced to formulate the experiment theoretically to give the objects uh, a sharp definition which it doesn't have, has and which it do not know. And then you get a result which is blurred by the choice of the definition. So, so that is the only benefit such types of logic have. One should also not overestimate. Thank you, Nils Gregersen from Copenhagen. This is a question to Harvey Friedman. I think it was very interesting with this idea about the embedded uh, maximal clique. I have one question. Uh, it seems to me that if you run a computer program and uh, for 16 generations, so to speak, of cliques, of embedded cliques, uh, it seems to me that you will end up with a finite number unless you put in some irrational numbers that will not end. No, no, of end. course. A, a large, a lar there's a large number of 16-length paths. Yes. You want to, this, this theorem using the never, 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 ever land of, of extreme, extreme, extreme infinities proves in advance that there must be a 16-length path. You then confirm it by running the computer. Yes. And since it's a, a good, healthy supercomputer, and you yes. have a week of, or so to run yes. it, it's, it out, 
out, it should pop. I haven't, we haven't done the programming to do this, but uh, you know, it should pop out the 16-lane certificate. Yes. So that means that uh, this still raises the question about what is the what is the traction, or how do they come together? The the notion of the extremely infinite the idea embedded maximal clique, and okay. and, and and this uh, 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 computer run uh, simulation. The idea is that if you didn't believe this theorem, and this theorem requires this extreme infinity, if you didn't believe this theorem, didn't believe the extreme infinity, and somebody said to you, "Is this thing going to kick out a 16 lane certificate?" You have no way whatsoever of making that prediction without running it. Now, the fact that you can predict something that uh, 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 is, a, is a form of confirmation. Thank you. Does that make sense? Yes. So we've used up our 85 minutes on this round, and I thank our two speakers and I thank the audience for the interesting discussion.